Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this webinar on manufacturing on the edge. Um, I'm going to give it a few minutes, uh, expecting people to be joining as we speak. Um, and thank you all for, for joining. Um, this is part of a new series that we're, we're doing within Digital Catapult, uh, which is on knowledge sharing and we're starting on said edge compute in a, an industrial manufacturing setting. So I'm just going to give it a few more minutes and then uh, well, a minute or two and then I will kick off. Um, yeah. So now I think I'll make a start. Um, I think I'll make a start. So um, so I'm Paul Seeley, I'm the Director of Technology Strategy at Digital Catapult, and it's my great pleasure to introduce um, uh, this webinar to everyone today. Um, as mentioned just uh, when it started, this is part of a new set of, of, um, of events that we're running, uh, a new webinars on knowledge sharing, and we're starting obviously with, uh, with Edge Compute in the manufacturing setting. Um, and oops. If I just before we start that, um, so just to introduce Digital Catapult, so we're the UK authority on advanced digital technology. So we are looking to accelerate the industrial adoption of advanced digital technologies through collaboration and innovation to drive growth for the UK, uh, for the UK overall. And uh, we bring together diverse communities. So we're joining together between um, academic research environments and startups and scale ups and in industry uh, end adopters. And we do this through challenges and we have a, a technical, a technical um, environment and test beds where we can really demonstrate uh, through our facilities and, and help companies adopt technology. So today's um, webinar is going to explore and focus on industrial edge. So edge in the context of a manufacturing environment, uh, look at its potentials and benefits. And I'm really excited today because you've got a really nice set of set of speakers uh, with different perspectives on this who can give a really, a really good view of, of what this means. And this, as I say, it's about uh, accelerating the adoption of technology. So this is really, really what we're about. So if I start off, we've got a quick poll, uh, which I'd like, which hopefully is appearing on, on your screen. Uh, which is for you to give your thoughts of your current level of understanding. And then while you're thinking about that, hopefully not thinking too hard, I'm going to move on to the housekeeping. So um, this is being recorded and it's being recorded because we're going to be sharing the, uh, the, um, sharing the event. Um, the video is going to appear on our YouTube channel. Um, it's set up as a Zoom webinar, so um, so you're, uh, you can't unmute yourself or show your screen. Um, however, there is a chat box and there is a Q&A box as well, and we're using that Q&A box for the panel. So if there are questions relating to the panel, please put it in there. Um, uh, and um, that's it, I think. Uh, but if I can go to the next slide. Now, what are the results? Do I have the results? Um, not sure I've got the results to to hand. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second then because I don't have the results up. But um, uh, if I can start my section, that's probably the thing to do here. So I'll give you the results results of that um, when I when I finish towards the end. So um, so first of all, what I'm going to do is start with. Um, start with a brief introduction into edge computing. Now I'm, I'm talking about edge computing in a general sense. Um, uh, uh, and my colleague Munir will be, will be speaking about it specifically in this environment. Just a very brief introduction, a few thoughts about edge and why we are, are where we are and why now is the time to be thinking about it. So this is the question that's often asked or discussed is what is edge compute? And, um, and also the, the concept has been around for a while, it's been discussed for a while. I think, um, I think from my perspective, um, I've been working on edge compute now for in one form or other for probably eight or nine years. Um, and um, it's still, still a bit of uncertainty around it, still shifting around, I'd say, the concept. Um, and this, this is why I wanted to um, talk about it. Um, to, uh, why we wanted to talk about now, to give my view of where we are. So just thinking a little bit about that edge, the word, um, it being sort of a boundary of sorts. So I'm a, I, I 
technology strategy. So I'm thinking sort of sort of quite abstract terms, unfortunately. And so it's it's a boundary. So so this is supposed to be an illustration of that, an illustration of globe, and you've got people, and the edge of what they see was is the horizon. And obviously, people where they're standing will be see different things. And then um, so very much where you are gives you a define, and what you're looking at gives you a definition of, of, of the edge. And then if you bring, say, here another person in, then um, they may have a different perspective. And in this case, this person's edge is actually in the middle for someone else. Um, and it's just a, this is just a, like a bit of an illustration, but, but to, to bring it, to make it real, I'm just thinking about, so this might be, um, say, a network operator uh, who might think that, uh, that who, who, from their perspective, the edge of their network is actually uh, right in the middle of, of, uh, of an enterprise, particularly multinational, be right, in, right in the middle of their, of their network. Um, and so, so, so this leads to some sort of confusion between them. Or, or for an example, um, if you've got a cloud, uh, a global cloud organization, then they would be, uh, they would create, um, they would create a, uh, uh, they, they would think that their edge is say, is say the data center that's nearest to you. Uh, but that might actually be right in the center, or they might put some equipment in an enterprise or in, in an operator's network, which again will be right in the middle of that network, but that's the edge of the cloud. So, so it's very much perspective where you come from. And then what that means is that we end up with, um, with spending an enormous amount of time, lots and lots of confusion about what we mean when we're talking about edge. And everyone, not everyone, often there's conversations where people are talking about cross, talking at cross purposes, where one person is referring to an edge, whereas it's not. So here's, here's a whole list of the terms that, that I've seen used in, in this. Uh, and we end up talking about the edge or where it is or what it is and so on. Um, and we spend much less time talking about the problems that we're trying to solve, which I, I think is what is really important in this. And, and this is what some of the speakers later will be discussing. We invent this lexicography of, of, of different things, trying to describe exactly what we mean by it and all, all of these terms. But for me, it's all about um, what this really boils down to is centralizing versus distribution. But this isn't new. So, so here I'm illustrating uh, that is supposed to be a pendulum swinging from side to side. Uh, so you might start off, let's say, think about music, start off live performance in person. Uh, that might be at the edge, let's say, and then you move to sort of something centralized and broadcast and then come back to LPs. Um, and then you go to TV and then you have something very personal in terms of um, analog or digital to Walkman or, or, or iPods. Um, and then you go back the other way to Spotify and, and streaming. And you've got the same example for computing, very similar, very similar kind of evolution over time. And, um, and I think the edge came up because I think 10 to 15 years ago, when the starting of the migration to public cloud and centralized cloud, I think everyone could see that, that there, that's not going to be optimal for everything. Um, so so there'll be use in, use in having some, some edge computing. And um, I chose music fairly randomly as, a, as, as an example of, of sort of centralizing and, 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 not, uh, and, and distributing. Um, but I think it's quite a good example for a couple of reasons. One is that um, in live music, uh, when you've got live in-person performance, um, that's actually quite a broad set from a stadium, stadiums of tens of thousands to uh, individual personal. And that could be analogous to, uh, to operator edge. Uh, which has really got quite a big footprint to um, constrained edge, which might be on a single device um, uh, and, and very limited. And also another thing that is, is potentially of interest is in this compute environment. And I think Munir will touch on this a bit more. We've got, um, uh, we've got a lot of legacy around there in these kind of environments. So LPs are still around, for example. But if I just quickly, quickly move on. So, so why now? So I think the original idea was there's spare compute capacity and people could see that something not central was useful, but it was a capability looking for a problem. Um, and that's the slowest way of innovating in, in my view, which is why I think why it's taken a bit of time because we're sort of finding these problems now, but it's been taking a while without a clear problem to be solved. Now, now we're at the point where we, I think we have some very strong examples of where centralization doesn't work very well. And, 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 and Munir and, and the speakers I know from, uh, from the panel we have later will also be speaking on these. Some really great examples of, of this. And I think where you can see performance, um, cost, or huge data volumes, or legal boundaries, for example, legal or commercial boundaries mean you can't share things. So, so we've been doing some work on, on federated, um, federated learning to solve some of these problems. And also we have the tools to manage this. So I think, I think now, 
time has come as in hybrid models and so on. Now the time has come uh, where we can do this. And um, I will finish there um, and hand over to my colleague. And what I'm really looking forward to is the rest of the speakers bringing these kind of ideas to life. Um, so if I can hand over to Munir Chowdhury, the head of technology IoT, and uh, he uh, will talk about uh, edge in the context of manufacturing. So if I can ask Munir to uh, put, your, put your camera on and go off mute, and I will do the reverse. And I'll be running the, um, are you with me in here? Uh, and I'll be running yeah, the- okay. Yeah, thank okay, you Paul. Great. And I'll be running the, um, the, uh, the, the, this for you. So if you can shout when you want me to move from, from the next slide onwards. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so if we move on to the next slide. Then. Yeah, so um, I think uh, uh, it's, it's great to see such a diverse uh, um, part, uh, range of uh, participants so, um, within manufacturing and outside of manufacturing. Um, and it's fair to say that over the last 12 to 18 months, we've seen transition in the manufacturing industry uh, for various reason um, uh, mostly related to the pandemic um, but what we are seeing is that there is a, a rebound uh, effort, uh, effect and uh, next please uh, Paul. Uh, and what, what we're seeing is that um, uh, the businesses that are actually um, benefiting most are looking at um, uh, to transform their uh, business in terms of productivity, in terms of efficiency, eliminating waste and errors, uh, in efficiency in production and inventory management, um, preventing defects and improving quality and so on. Um, next, please. And for the most part, not all, um, the, the, the businesses that are moving the fastest are the ones that have started uh, have either adopted in their uh, uh, programs or uh, are, have started the journey to uh, digital uh, innovation, uh, part of the industry 4.0 umbrella. So um, bringing together technologies such as the Internet of Things, the 5G, artificial intelligence, um, and what what this is doing is it's providing these uh, businesses. Uh, to build a new competitive advantage. Uh, next, please pause. Um, and the, the, the effect of implementing digital is that it gives rise to a new set of demands and demands in computing, storage, and analytics. And um, over the years, that has been sort of uh, getting quite um, it's being magnified to some extent. Next slide, please. Um, and so the early stages of uh, uh, digital innovation has been fo uh, focused around um, the paradigm of cloud computing. And over the last 25 years, this has been the dominant philosophy for digital. Um, what's interesting about all of this is that the collecting and the processing of the data brings uh, a number of additional complexities. Uh, next, please. Um, and we've seen the, the, the volume of data from many data sources growing massively and the demand for real-time processing and, uh, has become more personalized uh, for decision-making. Next, please. So if we look at some of the examples, um, in the early stages, uh, smart meters was quite uh, popular and they typically generated low amounts of data. Um, but if we move into other use cases, such as connected vehicles or in the smart factory for a medium sized factory that's fully connected with all of the machinery, you, you could see um, close to a, a petabyte of data per day. Um, and then, and as, as we see from, the, uh, from these use cases, uh, they're very different. So um, the cloud computing uh, philosophy or paradigm is no longer practical for every type of application, um, especially when we get 
to the magnitude of smart factory where you have lots of uh, machines and systems all connected and producing data every milliseconds. Um, so we want to use the data to optimize productivity and, and quality and monitor all of the control processes in real time um, and be able to react to unforeseen events. Uh, so for, for many, many of these applications, cloud computing becomes somewhat prohibitive. Next, please. So uh, there is an inherent need uh, to support an infrastructure where all of this data doesn't have to travel to the cloud and travel all the way back. Um, as this introduces latency um, for, and for real-time data processing, this is a, a very, very um, challenging process. Um, so um, Edge in the context that uh, Paul described uh, provides a means for immediate data collection and uh, from these connected systems and machinery and being able to analyze the data at source instead of sending it to the cloud. This leads to faster operational responsiveness and ultimately more informed decision-making within the business. Next, please. Now, from a, um, a, te a technical point of view, obviously latency, overcoming the latency and the ability to make real-time uh, decisions is a benefit. But um, in terms of the business benefit, the real advantage is that edge computing provide for manufacturing. Um, these, these are just the parameters which are the enablers. What are the benefits? Well, some of these are listed in here. These aren't exhaustive, but um, they seem to be um, the uh, benefits businesses tend to look for uh, most. So for example, in industrial automation, linking all of the systems on the factory floor, um, it's possible to um, look for anomalies and future states uh, and uh, be proactive in the decision-making and, and all of the processes uh, can be automated, uh, such as uh, so that technicians can be dispatched on site or um, stocks can be replenished and raw material and even productivity and efficiency can be controlled. Um, downtime is a, a, a quite an acute problem in many, many uh, uh, manufacturing environments. Performance and health of a system or machinery can be continuously monitored in real time with um, IoT and artificial intelligence and machine learning. And with more data uh, at the edge, a future state can be predicted and proactive scheduling of maintenance can be um, planned before the event occurs. And not only that, mechanics can be prepared with the right equipment, parts and instructions to resolve the potential issues at the first time. So eliminating downtime and reducing costs is a benefit. And with uh, other technologies such as computer vision, augmented and virtual reality technologies, and high-speed connectivity such as 5G, such maintenance can also be performed remotely in real time between a technician and a non-technical person, eliminating the need for expensive uh, maintenance contracts. Uh, product quality can also be enhanced with edge solutions um, where uh, computer vision, IoT, and AI can be all combined to collect um, and uh, the data and the uh, analyze in real time. Um, and so uh, products can be uh, inspected and decisions being made about the product quality faster and more accurately than any humans potentially can. And uh, through uh, real-time monitoring of the production lines, Automated management of inventory levels, edge computing can also help manufacturers plan their resources better with AI-based supply chain uh, uh, demand forecasting. And so in, by incorporating the supply chain data, bottlenecks can be eliminated as they rise. Um, health and safety is another benefit. Uh, edge computing can help uh, run and analyze data right at the um, machine equipment uh, with IoT and AI. Uh, capabilities, so real-time information needed to make decisions uh, and avoid high-risk conditions. Energy, I think energy management is a, is a big problem. Uh, and so energy consumption uh, is one of the biggest concerns. And with IoT sensors, AI, edge computing helps manufacturers analyze in real-time the energy con consumption of machinery 
and data can be used to optimize the production processes and lower the energy consumption. Um, just to give you some indication, it's forecasted by 2030, 20% of the world's energy com consumption will come from uh, IoT enabled uh, data being processed in the cloud. So edge computing can also help improve this energy usage by optimizing the energy used for compute and storage. Um, digital twins allow you to model and visualize your business assets and carry out scenarios, uh, scenario planning in terms of what if scenarios. And edge computing enables digital twins to go further combining real time data to be fully augmented to the digital representation of complex physical world environments. And so it's therefore uh, through all of that is possible to achieve a 360 degree view of the air entire operations. What all of these benefits demonstrate is that edge computing can bring uh, many business benefits. I think one of the other uh, business benefit is that, it's a, is that it can be a game changer in terms of uh, the business model. So linking the uh, factory floor across the value chain can help shape new business models to capture new opportunities such as uh, manufacturing as a service. Um, so um, I'm going to stop here for now. Uh, uh, next, please. And uh, carry out a quick poll. Um, and uh, it'll be great to understand which of the benefits that I've listed are the most appealing to your business. Okay, so um, well, well, the poll results are coming through. Ah, there they are. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, industrial automation and digital twins seems to be quite um, high in the interest levels. Um, the others are pretty much even, um, but uh, around a third of uh, people indicated that uh, industrial automation and digital twins are quite appealing. So let's let's move on to uh, the some of the um, um, challenges. Now, um, now the uh, challenges with edge computing is uh, for manufacturing. Let's look at the typical manufacturing setup in here. In here, this is kind of the OT space of uh, typical manufacturing. You have a lot of sensors, machinery, all connected um, uh, on field level. There are many um, sensors that are connected via IO links, um, connected through motors and IO devices and control those PLCs and other controller systems. They all work over uh, different buses and interfaces. And so it's a complex environment. And there, in terms of the uh, ecosystem, unless you're using a, a single vendor uh, to source all of it, it can get quite complex. In a similar way, um, if you go next, oh, if we introduce the edge infrastructure, um, there's a lot of planning from your IT department that will be required in terms of the connectivity piece. There's also a, a similar type of stack to the OT space, as you can see in there, quite the layers. Um, and each of these stacks add different levels of complexity with different um, vendors providing different pieces of the solution. Um, and this requires knowledge and expertise uh, of uh, the uh, different technologies and also uh, interoperability between the OT and the IT space. space. And as you grow your uh, um, edge solution and maybe even connect it to your back office enterprise to the cloud, um, you could get into the scenario of lots of distributed edge uh, um, solutions, sometimes sitting in silos, sometimes connected. So um, understanding the scalability uh, uh, issues uh, requires uh, also additional expertise and scalability, scalability in this uh, instance is also in itself a, a problem. And added to that is a cost of implementation with um, in the cloud, it, it's quite simple to just add storage and compute on demand. With Edge, it requires additional planning and planning in advance. For example, 
to what extent do you want to uh, retain your data for how long and what level of compute in terms of uh, analytics do you want to perform and how much memory, for example, could you need? So there, there is a, a, a need to understand upfront and invest upfront on the infrastructure. Next, please. So these are uh, these are the high, uh, summary of the um, challenges that I've mentioned. Um, interoperability, the landscape of, of the edge is is quite complex sometimes, uh, and uh, the skills and expertise required for the integration and, uh, and to grow your entire infrastructure and architecture, and the costs associated with it. Um, next, please, Paul. So with these challenges, which of these challenges do you feel that uh, uh, are of your biggest concerns for your business? The results are coming through. Yeah. Yeah, it's not surprising that the majority of you have indicated skills and expertise and the uh, followed by the ITOT interoperability as the main concerns. So the the uh, data over the last five years seem to indicate that these are the most uh, priorities uh, for uh, adoption from an adoption point of view. Well, thanks very much for uh, listening to that and participating in the polls. So I'm going to hand back to Paul for the remaining part of the sessions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that, Munir. That was uh, that was really interesting uh, run through of the detail of um, a detail of what it means for a manufacturing industry. And um, just coming back to my poll, apologies, I'm sharing my screen so I didn't see it. So. In terms of uh, level of understanding, we had a bit of a mixture, I think, uh, with um, the winner being uh, poor understanding. A few good goods, uh, no very goods. So, so hopefully we've got a bit, a bit, uh, a bit of interesting uh, content for everyone. But it, what I'd like to do, with um, uh, without further ado, is to hand over to David Pugh, my colleague, um, who will introduce and chair the panel. So I will. Um, Hand over to you and I'll take myself off the screen and uh, you can introduce the, uh, the panellists. Thanks Paul, good afternoon everyone. My name is David, I'm the Manufacturing Market Lead here at the Digital Castport and uh, for the remainder of this session we'll be speaking to four industry experts on how they're using Edge today and how it works. So I'd like to, without further ado, invite my panellists onto the screen. Um, so Piyush, Byrne, Claire and Alex, if you could come on onto the virtual stage. Hi all. Um, and so we've all uh, met, of course, but if we could start with just a quick round of introductions for our audience, start mm -hmm. with you, Claire. Hello, Claire Caminade. I'm the head of 5G product and partnership for Digital Catapult. And Piyush? Uh, hi, I'm Piyush Modi. I lead the global business development and strategy at NVIDIA uh, for the industrial and manufacturing sector. And Bernd? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Bernd Gross. I'm the CTO of uh, Software HD. And last but not least, Alex. Hi everyone, uh, Alex Griffiths. Uh, I'm in charge of IoT integration, uh, including edge computing, as part of BA Systems uh, manufacturing R&D programs in the back of the future. Brilliant. And if you're watching at home, um, please do ask questions. So on, at the bottom of your Zoom panel on the screen now, you should see a Q&A button. If you, if you have any questions for our panel, please type them in and we'll come to them later in the panel. Uh, now to start, I'm interested to hear from all of you about the different roles that the technologies you work in or the areas that you work in are looking at Edge and what the roles of different existing technologies play in making Edge a real thing. So how does Edge differ from current technologies and how does it enhance that, that technology? So I'd like to start with you, Claire, from a 5G perspective, how does Edge really uh, expand on the work that you're already doing? So I think one of the biggest uh, 5G promises is uh, the low latency and the real-time critical communication. This is one of the 
the most promising use case and definitely uh, the one that industry is looking at uh, more than the consumer market. And I mean, you cannot achieve uh, low latency without uh, mobile edge compute uh, somewhere in the solution. May so if we go back to Paul, uh, we can argue where is that edge compute can be on premises and it could be a bit further away and still deliver low latency, but there is a need for edge compute. It can't be centralized and achieve uh, the one millisecond. <laughs> this is like the ultimate dream uh, latency that 5G promises. So I hope I did answer <laughs> the question. Fantastic. And, and moving on to, to Bernd. You tell us a bit about um, IoT's role. Yes, so um, you know, we we uh, in the wider vision of uh, what we call a, a truly connected world, um, edge computing plays a very important role because what we do foresee is that you know everything will be interconnected, right? We I think we all agree to that vision. Now, how do you make it happen? Uh, is is a combination of edge and cloud. It's not just edge. It's not just cloud, it's really both a so-called hybrid cloud environment. So you really have to um, you know, um, challenge or master the challenges of the on-prem world, um, manufacturing on-prem requirements with low latency, data aggregation, uh, et cetera. And autonomy, by the way, also very important. If the connection towards the cloud isn't there, it needs still to run in many use cases. So the autonomy is, is also very important. So if these requirements, and um, you have the, the possibility to connect the physical world, how we describe it. But then in many enterprise use cases, you also have to walk backwards to your IT operations because your business processes are sitting on IT applications, IT enterprise applications like ERP systems, CRM systems, et cetera. So you need to overcome the, the OT world with the IT world to integrate these in order to make, uh, in, including the cloud services, more and more, you know, workload is moving from the IT to the cloud. So these three areas, you have to be able to connect in order to make, um, you know, a truly connected world work in the most efficient way. And edge plays a fundamental role because without edge, you wouldn't be able to really deploy the, the physical data streams from the physical world into your setup. So it's a very important enabler. Great, I'm Piers. Oh, hi, uh, so we take the holistic view on this. Uh, if you think about the last 10 years in industrial and manufacturing, uh, there's been tremendous investment made in bringing sensors and connected assets through IoT. It's expected these devices are projected to grow to almost 150 billion by 2025 and even more than trillion by 2035. However, what we are noticing is it's resulted in a lot of uh, assets that are connected, a lot more data, probably a lot more dashboards, but yet large portion of this data, almost 99% remains unutilized. Uh, so we are at this junction where we have some interesting technologies emerging, uh, IoT, married with 5G, which is promising to really solve the problem of how to get the bandwidth thousand times more at a 10, 10x less lower latency uh, compared to 4G. Uh, and, and to make this data meaningful, AI-led technologies are beginning to kind of shape up and delivering outcomes in a major way. So given that it seems most economic to leverage the latencies and bandwidth given by 5G, uh, also uh, addressing the security challenges that comes with manufacturing, uh, which, which is preventative as we call it law of the land, so to speak, where they, it's best to process data where they originate or in the nearest proximity of it and at the lowest cost to really derive the meaningful outcome that thanks to deep learning now, we are able to address whole data veracity that comes into manufacturing. It could be very high frequency vibration data, time series data, it could be sensor data, it can be video cameras giving you surveillance, or it could be all the mining of the logs, the natural language processing of uh, 
worker created input in the form of the system of records. How do you mine and converge all of this? The deep learning gives you the algorithms to achieve that. Uh, and then detecting anomalies and predicting failures ahead of time, uh, almost estimated that AI uh, processing at the edge is going to unleash economic impact of almost $11 trillion per year. Uh, so we are sitting on an amazing convergence of these three technologies. And at NVIDIA, we're looking at all three and say, how do we provide one converged platform that facilitates the connectivity, uh, that facilitates the processing of this data where it matters, following the uh, rules of data gravity or law of the land, as I said, uh, in terms of protecting security, privacy, yet bringing in the most demand needed compute and networking where it matters to process them with the most modern AI algorithms. That's brilliant, thank you. And Alex, from a manufacturing standpoint, how is Edge helping you? How are you looking at use cases for Edge and seeing how it will expand the kind of what you're doing today? This is it, actually. I have to be slightly boring and agree with everyone who's just, who's just spoken, um, because it's not a, a case that everything is suitable for edge processing or, or everything can go in the cloud. So it, it's a kind of case of matter of where you draw the line. Uh, and, and a lot of times this is a matter of definition. So like take the phrase real time, which I think Claire, Claire brought up. If you're looking at real time monitoring, it could well be that if someone's just trying to supervise what's going on in the factory, um, you know, getting getting a report within five seconds, ten seconds, frankly, in some cases within five minutes, would, would be enough to come as, as real time. But if you're trying to do real time adjustment of processes, if you're trying to actually control machines, that would be completely infeasible. You need to get down to that kind of handful of millisecond or sub millisecond that, that that needs the edge processes back at the edge. Um, I'm going off a bit. I'm already forgetting what the actual question was. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. Um, would you mind resetting the question? Sorry. Yeah, so how are, you, how are you seeing edge edge being used and how is it enhancing the work you're doing with with um with technologies you're currently using yeah absolutely so we so we are looking at, at real-time control of, of machines so so uh, adapting to changing circumstances uh, in real time part of that's to do with with kind of deep learning machine learning we also have issues with data volumes uh, so where we're trying to monitor processes we have machines that can generate multiple terabytes of data a day uh, and if you then have an entire factory full of those machines streaming all that up into the cloud somewhere is going to be an absolute nightmare uh, so we do use or, or are looking to use kind of edge resources for machine learning and so on to extract the valuable information extract the valuable information from the raw data and keep the data local um, you know there are there's also security elements um, and particularly uh, i mean any company will have these concerns um, I'm sure, but as a defense company in particular, some of the, some of the data we're using counts as you know, national security uh, kind of rated data. Um, and for a lot of our projects, uh, selling the idea of storing that data in the cloud is um, it's a difficult sell to the IT and cybersecurity departments. Uh, if there is an option to handle that data locally, if there is an option to not have to send it anywhere, that's always going to be the easier path to go. Uh, so it, it really does, it pops up in a number of places, you know, how it can lend benefit to manufacturing. Fantastic. And we talk about the conceptual edge use cases. We talked, especially in, in the session today, about what, what edge can do. How close are we really to having these real life um, use cases? Bern, would you, uh, I'll come to you first. What real world use cases are we seeing now and how close are we to actually getting the benefits of edge as opposed to it being a, a future technology? No, I, I think uh, um, it's, it's, it's happening definitely. So we have, uh, for example, uh, quite a few uh, clients. Actually, our Edge uh, product in our portfolio, we have uh, three different Edge uh, solutions. What is Syn Edge is for embedded Linux type of devices with a small, very small footprint. Now we have up to SIG Edge, which is a server-based, uh, you know, multi uh, core uh, environment, right? So we have a very variety of edge technologies, but definitely this is growing um, by over 200, 250% uh, a year. So it's a really the fastest growing segment of our IoT uh, portfolio that underlines the, the importance of edge, I believe. And some concrete use cases, it's really like in the energy side, for example, a client of us, Nordex, a wind turbine manufacturer, they have actually the cloud, a cloud environment, cloud platform with the cloud services to operate wind turbines globally. They have a an, an operator operating center where they have a few dozens of people really monitoring these wind turbines. But then when you really 
really think about um, you know autonomous uh, operations and also more uh, low latency functionality. Um, they have deployed a SCADA-like system on top of our edge technology for the wind farms. So I think that's the kind of the, the, the combination what we see, you know, or wind farms with edge and then the, the global operation operating center based on the cloud. That's what I meant with the hybrid type of um, use cases we see. Another example quickly is, uh, for example, in the automotive industry, one of our clients, Dior, they're producing painting, uh, painting robots for the automotive industry, global player in that domain. They actually monitor the quality of the paint uh, jobs on the mm -hmm. cars through the integration of the robots into the edge uh, compute and we are analyzing here uh, with a high frequency 100,000 data points a second. Yeah, that's a quite a massive amount. And the, the quality of the, the paint uh, uh, operations and can identify very fast potential issues, etc. That wouldn't be possible, to be frank, with a cloud only deployment. So that kind of shows also the importance of Edge. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. And, and Piers, do you have any, any interesting cases and, and things yeah, that are happening we, now as opposed to future, future use cases? Certainly, certainly. So we're seeing a very broad adoption across the board in manufacturing, whether it's agriculture, transportation and logistics, semiconductor, warehouse, uh, aerospace or auto or metals and mining even, right? Everywhere. And these use cases are stemming following the entire life cycle of an asset that is being produced, we call it product. And in the context of uh, the process that's followed to make the product in the context of the machine itself, uh, looking at its health and how it is performing in the context of people working next to it and giving context to how they are getting ev in every cycle time of the making of a part, how they are getting about it, looking at their ergonomics, making them safer and giving them extra kind of, if I may call it superpowers to do their job right or train them on the spot. So a use cases range from uh, inspection of any assets, small defects on a wafer mask to looking at aluminum cans as they are zipping through 30 cans per second on a beverage manufacturing line, uh, especially in a condition where these cans could change their skins. They can have dew drops, yet you have to find those wrinkles. Uh, looking at uh, video cameras at every station to saying how workers are performing, uh, looking at even robotic operations, if they are soldering a rooftop, are they putting the right amount of solder before the rooftop gets assembled? to looking at the health of uh, machine tools. Uh, are they performing to the precision required or are the jobs going haywire by mounting even cameras inside the NC machines or looking at the welding jobs while they are being done. So it's giving us an opportunity which never existed, which is to look at everything as it is getting made accurately, predicting the process deviations, predicting how workers are performing and increasing collaboration. And one use case where all of this come, came together for us is a BMW story around uh, where, where this is a factory where they make almost one car every minute. They adopted uh, NVIDIA's Omniverse platform to piece together all their digital assets which could be the CAD drawings, uh, the PLM data, the data that lives in MES system for operations, the data about the plant design itself, created a digital world out of it through ray tracing, they are able to portal out, visualize their world in digital. They are able to simulate how the robots move and collaborate with each other, how they move around their timing going from station to station, collaborating with other robots and humans, and really training a process uh, that's optimal for them, and then deploying it in real life. Yet enabling all the folks who come into, who bring their tacit domain knowledge together to collaborate in creating this digital twin of an entire factory. So that, that's kind of, these are all the use cases happening now. 
Fantastic. So from, I'd like to talk about how, how we make these things a reality. And one of the biggest hurdles that came from our panel, our, not our, our poll, sorry, was skills and expertise. And I'd like to come to Claire first and say, how, what are the skills and expertise that are really required to, to start adopting these technologies? What, who, what kind of things does industry need to be doing to bring these skills into their existing workforces? Oh my word, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the best place to say that because I don't come from industry, but I would say from a 5G point of view, this is my little area of expertise. Uh, we are facing a deep, deep lack of skills um, for the simple fact that uh, universities have been training uh, telecommunication engineers for vendors and for mobile network operators. And now the whole industry wants to have their own uh, network engineer, there's not enough. <laughs> Uh, so the way we approach that in, uh, when we, uh, at Digital Catapult is we uh, act uh, as a technical design authority, for instance, and we really uh, get uh, to, uh, uh, to be that single uh, stop shop where if you have a 5G question, you come to us and how you integrate that. And uh, that I would say that obviously, as Bernd uh, uh, said earlier, or even Munir is, uh, in order to deliver the full uh, solution, you need that full integration in the full stack. I am not sure there is on this planet people who have a deep understanding of 5G networks, for instance, and a deep understanding of OT technologies and a deep understanding of IT and a deep understanding of everything to be able. So it has to be collaborative, I have to say. And all the projects we've been at at this stage is we, we everybody has to chip in and, and put their expertise uh, at one stage, we will come with easier solution, but as it stands now, uh, it's about collaboration and being open uh, and bringing mm -hmm. what you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And Alex, BAE Systems have been building up a digital culture for a number of years now and doing a really great job. What kind of skills have you seen tr from training traditional engineers to, to be able to use these technologies and develop them for industrial <laughs> use? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, okay, so I think one of the best advantages we've got from bringing existing engineers into the digital space is more a matter of vision than technical delivery. So uh, edge computing and so on is not a monolith. There's lots of different skills required for different parts of it. Um, you know, how you actually connect devices up is probably within the domain of uh, an IT department. Uh, what you then do with the data and so on is maybe more kind of data engineering, data science. The real question a lot of the time is why? What's the benefit? What, what are we getting out of this? What, what, are, what are we actually looking to improve or looking to, 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 to gain from this? And that's something where I think we've, we've seen benefit from bringing people in from other work streams. Um, so, for example, we've got, got people um, looking at using uh, smart tools as kind of uh, edge devices, but the people who are, who are bringing them in and helping integrate them are people who've come off the shop floor and have been using traditional tools for ages. Um, we've got people looking at um, augmented reality again, who are, sort of, who are people who will have used that data uh, in, their, in, previous, in their previous role and know what's actually required. Having an actual measurable objective going into this kind of program. Uh, having something you're some some identified problem you're looking to solve is a big 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 part of it being success because if you're just looking to flail around and see what we can do with this fancy new fashionable technology that everyone's using you're setting yourself up for failure absolutely yeah defining your use cases and the reason for doing it is really important it shouldn't be just technology mm -hmm. for technology's mm -hmm. sake uh, burned and uh, we've just what kind of skills do you think by collaborating with companies like yourselves our industry able to get and and where do you see the need for from a from a, a customer point of view what what kind of skills are required and what expertise is required inside a manufacturing um organization to be able to really adopt these and use them well yeah i think there are, there are really um, two two sides on it i think i fully agree with what uh, has been said already i think um, it's not possible to have one single team to master all the challenges of the new stack i call it a new software stack let's put it in this way so do you need a, a collaboration of various um, techniques? But I think that that's becoming more and more accessible. I do believe that um, you know we have um, you know more and more standards emerging. For example, you know five years ago I haven't seen OPC UA as widely deployed as today. For example, and today OPC uh, UA is becoming really an industrial standard. And you know five years ago. Uh, probably I haven't seen so much self-service tooling in the operational technology in the shop floor as I see today. You know? And 
And self-service, I think it's a great way of overcoming the, the, the issues in terms of uh, competence lack. Because what we really want to do is we want to create an intuitive user interfaces for the non-data scientists. We want to have self-service for people who are really working on the machines, who are operating it. For example, I gave you the um, example in the automotive industry with the painting robots from Dior, right? So what we did there is we created a user interface so that the operator who are operating these robots yeah, can actually use um, drag and drop and uh, uh, toolings for optimizing their uh, current uh, situation, their current shop floor environment. So they have actually a streaming analytics engine behind where they can set up new rules and new requirements and correlate some input parameters they feel are important. And by doing so, they continuously improve. Right? And so somehow that's the, that's the vision. How can we empower these people who are non-software engineers to continuously improve and get efficiency going? And I think that's really something I believe self-service tools will be a great opportunity for us to, to en enable these uh, mm -hmm. people. Absolutely, absolutely. And on those first steps to a smart factory and onto a connected factory, legacy systems are a huge part of manufacturing today. And mm -hmm. another piece that came out of that poll was ITOT integration. So Piers, I'll come to you first. Where do you think... What, what can companies be doing to connect up these legacy systems and to start generating data from them? What, how, how, what, what are the first steps that need to be taken there? So first thing, we do have data. It's not, we don't. How to make data useful is the right question. Uh, to, and, and it also ties back to the skills question uh, to some degree, which is, first of all, there's a lot of knowledge in silos, buried in silos, data buried in silos. There is a divide between operational technology and IT technology. Uh, so how do you bring this together? And it needs to happen through user experiences which are immersive, self-serving, uh, the context of the machine, the context of the problem or uh, anomalies in a factory floor uh, or challenge that needs to be addressed with priority needs to come to the user in a way they understand. Secondly, this tool should be self-adaptive, self-learning in the context of allowing users to impart their knowledge. Uh, the biggest challenge we face in industrial world is a lot of this domain knowledge is sitting in people's head and a uh, lot of this workforce is about to retire. So, uh, and the new workforce entering the workforce, they learn techniques and tools through new canvas uh, of the mob mobility, the interfaces, et cetera. So how do you bring that together so that as you have these protocols like MQTT, OPC UA, et cetera, it gives you a paves a way for you to also tag the data in a way it is easy, ready for AI models to learn and curate. Secondly, uh, as we embark on this data transformation, it is, very essential to set up that empowering that organization to bring in a, the perspective both from the factory side and the data science side together so that how do you invest that there are far large number of factory workers there is a very few software application developers. that's also a large number because we've been doing for 20 years but when it comes to data science ai there is a far fewer workforce so Investing in that skills uh, is necessary for all manufacturers. Uh, so adopting that and, and with this workload comes uh, new workflows, how to capture the data, how to harness them, not just at a factory or a plant level or a line level, but across the, all the factories and estate at a fleet level, how to maintain their state uh, when these models are uh, deployed. Uh, their life cycle of it, how to secure them uh, is another IT primitive that needs to be focused on. And then training these models using the data uh, and practicing AI so that it delivers the outcome and use cases that matters the most is again, requires a custom uh, mindset uh, and explainability is gonna be very important in the context of manufacturing. So building AI that is transparent uh, it's trustworthy is also important. So these are all the areas 
uh, that needs to be set. And Vidya, what we call is, we have this thing called Deep Learning Institute through which we have curated curriculum, which allows both the business folks and uh, operational teams to understand what is the potential, what are these tools, how to blend them into what they would do today. Uh, we also working very closely with all the machine technology providers to embed AI transparently. Uh, we are adhering to all the standards and bringing, as we talked about, IoT, 5G, and AI into a converged platform. That's fantastic. We've got just about five minutes left on the panel. So I'd like to finish up with a question for everyone is where do we go from here? What's next and how do we get there? I'll start with you, Bern. Yeah, I think the, um, the uh, benefits of uh, the combination of edge and, and cloud, so the hybrid uh, environment is, uh, is quite obvious. I think a lot of clients, a lot of um, you know, partners, um, customers um, are deploying these. I, I do believe that uh, what we what we still have uh, you you mentioned the legacy situation we still haven't really found a good answer to overcome a brownfield situations it's very it's difficult to scale up yeah in brownfield situations and every factory looks different on the manufacturing side so so also um, equipment uh, using various you know protocols for for example. Um, what we needed to do when we started 10 years ago with the Cumulosity IoT uh, product offering, we introduced field protocols, one after one after one. Mm -hmm. Today, we have over 150 <laughs> different field protocols as part of our connectivity solution, right, in order to be able to overcome the brownfield challenges. Yeah? And, so, and, and therefore, I do believe that we do, um, you know, we will see a, a growth happening, but the, let's say, the exponential growth and adoption of our, of these technologies will relate to more standardized interfaces and adoption of standardized next generation uh, equipment. So that is kind of the, I think the exponential growth curve, what we foresee at the moment, therefore we work in a lot of uh, standardization uh, initiatives. So that's really what, what I think is the, the, the technology is there. Um, you should, uh, I would encourage everyone to try it out. There are open source available also from us, open source software stacks available. Please go ahead, try it out and, uh, you know, and, and start preparing yourself for a, a hybrid future. It's coming, I can promise it to you. Brilliant, thank you. And Claire, Claire, the same question, where do we go from here? There's also been a question directly on 5G asking how, how 5G compares to Wi-Fi and why, why 5G compared to Wi-Fi. If you could, could integrate that into your answer as well, that would be fantastic. So yeah, I was saying, I'm happy to, uh, I volunteered for that question. Uh, so there's many, there's some difference. So first of all, Wi-Fi isn't meant for um, mobility. It's meant for wireless, but it's not meant for asset moving. So definitely the performance will degrade or will become very inconsistent as you move around your router, not mentioning if you need to change router and you, you, this is even worse because it's not a roaming technology, whereas uh, mobile technology since the onset, the uh, first G, it's meant to absolutely seamlessly go from cell to cell and you don't cut your connectivity. And uh, uh, so that's one thing. So I would say if you have more assets that are meant to, to move around and they just forget about Wi-Fi or ex expect something that is not meant for critical communication. Um, the other difference, main, main difference for industrial end users is at the um, uh, predictability of the performance. Wi-Fi doesn't have a QoS that will guarantee a, a set uh, performance, where 5G is a consistency of performance that will really, for industrial processes, industrial communication is, uh, in most instances, absolutely critical to understand that, I don't know, we did a trial, for instance, with a robot and with computer vision, and they needed computer vision. Uh, they were hoping to have 25 frames per second, uh, we only achieved 20 frames per second, but they said, you know what, we don't care because it's 20 frames 
every second we have 20 frames and we can work around that and then develop an algorithm and then to then uh, do the computer vision that is required because we know it's always 20 frames a second. And they were extremely impressed because they did try several times. It was that consistency. They said, okay, we understand now why uh, it makes a difference. Uh, I hope I've answered the, the Wi-Fi question and my fellow panelists, obviously, are much more technically savvy than me. So if you are keen to answer, uh, add mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. uh, please feel free. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Um, so we're coming to the end of the panel. So Alex, what, where, where does where does Edge go from here? Where did, how how do you see the, the, the next few years changing the way using Edge to change the way you that you your that you work and um, undertake manufacturing operations? So first of all, a much much greater visibility of factory operations, much more real time uh, understanding of what's happening and what can be done about it if what's happening isn't what you want. Uh, I think uh, as a company, we're going to be looking into, into scaling up and moving out of our, so my, my department is an R&D environment. Um, so we're, we're, we're working up prototypes and, and, and proof of concepts, rolling out into, into real factory environments and, and, and proving it in anger, I suppose. It, it's going to be a big opportunity for us. Something I'm quite interested in and excited about personally, I think it has come up very briefly earlier on in the session, which is federated learning. So I, I mentioned um that for example we have systems churning out huge amounts of data we don't want to centralize that data but then if you want to train ai mechanisms on that data yeah. can, traditionally you need you need all that data you need to centralize it all anyway um so if we can have edge devices that are able to share their learning essentially with each other and have that kind of federated learning approach i think that's a real really beneficial group down the line i'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see uh the nodding from nvidia <laughs> And Piers, where do, where do you see Edge, Edge going from, from here? What, what do the next few years look like for Edge Compute and how are they going to change the way we manufacture things? Yeah, today we are proving at the Edge on one use cases at a time, each one of high value, having ROI and making an impact. We have a real opportunity to build the digital twin of factory, plant, the process itself. Uh, and, and let me double click on it. Where the real opportunity here is, it's an abstract term, a lot of people use it, but really what is going at the underneath is, uh, as uh, speakers were saying, with 5G, now you can go at a granular level, given a process, you generate variety of data, large veracity of data. They could be high velocity, slow velocity, high resolution, low resolution, First time with 5G, you can actually allocate bandwidth of choice for given a data traffic. So you have the ability to keep this digital twin current in real time for all sorts of data, meaning you have real time context with no latency available in digital world. What this accomplishes is now ability for you to have a realistic view of the factory floor operations holistically across all machines, all plants, all user contexts. And then through digital, best thing you could do is programmatically create different contexts that matters to the outcome you desire. So making a meaningful digital twins that will answer all sorts of logistic questions about what is going wrong or what is working now versus I want to achieve this target how best I should configure, reconfigure my factory and plant. And you're no longer restricted to those strict lanes or robots have to stay in their own zones. All of those shackles are coming out. Uh, so uh, we have a real opportunity here to really achieve this, uh, what we call industry 4.0, uh, going to 5.0 or uh, 5G, going to 6G with AI, uh, all the things you need, the canvas is ready. Brilliant. Thank you. And on, on that, I'd like to thank Piers, Byrne, Claire and Alex. Thank you um, to the panellists. Thank you to the audience for listening and for submitting your questions. And I'll hand back to Paul. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, if the panellists, if you could uh, take yourself off camera, that would be great. And then we'll wrap up this. So I will share my screen. So, um, so thank you everyone, and thank you everyone for contributing to this, and thank you for 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 the audience for listening. I think um, that was some really great examples and some great perspectives on, on this. I took away the kind of idea everything will be interconnected, and we'll have a hybrid of edge and cloud. Um, 
uh, and uh, and doing AI. A lot of discussion is doing AI across that, um, addressing security, latency, uh, and skills potentially in the way that we we use that. So I think if it is flexibly doing doing the compute, the analysis in the right place. Um, and um, as I say, thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you to the speakers. And uh, we will make this available um, uh, on our YouTube channel. So we'll, uh, we'll let you know when that happens. Um, and if you want to keep in touch, um, please sign up to our newsletter. That should be, I think, in the chat. One of my colleagues will have put the link to that in the chat to sign up to the uh, newsletter. And uh, if you'd like to hear more about what we're doing and uh, how we're advancing digital adoption in this space, please, uh, we've got uh, David's email there, so please get in contact. And I think after this, uh, we have a very quick, uh, quick survey that'd be great if you could uh, could respond to 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 so that we can we can we'll look at these kind of knowledge sharing events for the future. Anyway, um, thank you again, and thanks again to all, all of the speakers for providing their time and their. Uh, insight. I found it really interesting and I hope everyone uh, of that variety of different knowledges uh, did the same. So I will wrap up there and finish.